So yesterday I posted uh, part one of what is going to become a series of videos um, in response to Ron Lindsay's uh, talk. Um, part one was addressing his comments on privilege and part two is going to be about the concept of shut up and listen. So a lot of people tend to get very upset when somebody tells them to shut up and listen because there's this misunderstanding that shut up and listen means uh, stop talking, you have nothing worth saying, you um, should never speak again, blah, 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 and so they feel it's very silencing. But in reality, what shut up and listen is, or at least the shut up part of shut up and listen, is you need to stop talking in order to be able to hear what is actually being said. And the reason for this is because people have a tendency to not actually hear what is being said to them, especially in an argument, but rather to spend all of their time trying to figure out how to um, respond. And so rather than hearing what is being said, rather than processing it, rather than understanding it, rather than uh, you know utilizing empathy, they're too busy just concentrating on their own feelings, on their own response, on themselves, and, t and they're too busy as a result to really process what is being said. Um, and the best example that I can give of this is actually one from my own experiences in a situation where I really needed to shut up and listen. And it actually had to do with, with trans rights. And I had this friend who was transitioning. And at the same time that they were transitioning, um, even though I did, you know, I really wanted to be supportive and I, um, you know, thought I was being really supportive, um, I was also reading a lot of Dan Savage and getting a lot of my information about uh, trans rights and trans issues from Dan Savage rather than from, you know, actual trans people. And I figured, you know, Dan Savage was know what he's talking about, so it's perfectly okay for me to, you know, just go with what he's saying because he writes about these issues, therefore he must have some kind of knowledge and basis. And the obvious, and the situation where it became really obvious that I needed to, like, not listen to him and not listen to what I was saying, but I needed to shut up and listen to what was actually being said by trans people was on the issue of disclosure. So the issue of disclosure is that this concept that trans people have an obligation to disclose to their partners that they're trans prior to an intimate relationship. So in a situation of a one night stand, this means that you know a trans woman would have to tell the person she's hooking up with that she's trans um, before they get involved in any kind of sexual contact. And whether this is sexual contact that involves just kissing or anything more, um, more explicit than that. And then it further goes on to this idea that trans people have a responsibility to disclose to their partners at some point ever. And what a lot of trans, and so I was basically talking about it too, where it's like, no, 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 you know, yay, you know, trans people absolutely rights, everything, real women, but no, they really should disclose. And I wasn't hearing what my trans friends were trying to tell me when they were trying to tell me how fucked up this idea really was. And it wasn't until I actually read Natalie Reed's post about the issue that I had this light bulb moment. And this light bulb moment was this realization that what I was saying whenever I was talking about disclosure was that, for example, trans women weren't real women and that's why they had to tell, you know, the straight guy that they were sleeping with that they were trans because, you know, he had a right to know that he wasn't sleeping with a real woman. And that's not what I meant to say because I totally, you know, thought that I thought that trans women were real women. But what I was saying revealed differently. And so what shut up and listen means, not just, you know, stop talking and listen to what the other people are saying, but it can also include shut up and listen to what you're saying yourself. So was it my intent to say that? Was it my intent to suggest that they weren't real women? Was it my intent to suggest that, uh, you know, that, that uh, what actually ended up, I realized, being victim blaming because to a certain extent I was legitimizing violence against them uh, when people, you know, freaked out and, and were violent when they, um, when they found out that they were trans. No, of course I didn't mean to say that. In fact, I vehemently would say, no, I think, you know, abuse against them is totally, totally wrong, but they should disclose. And I didn't realize that I was basically still victim blaming and I was still saying these horrible things that I didn't mean to say at all, but that is what I was saying. Once I was able to shut up, stop talking long enough in order to hear what I was saying and what they were saying, I realized how fucked up what I was saying was and I was able to reevaluate my opinion. So that now if you were to ask me, I think that a trans person doesn't need to disclose ever. It's up to them if they ever want to. 
And even if they end up in a long-term, 20-year married relationship with someone, they still don't have to tell them if they don't want to. It, you know, it's completely their decision on when to do this because, you know, it's not, because their partner thinks that they're in a relationship with, you know, if, it, if they're in a relationship with a trans woman, that they think that they're in a relationship with a woman, and that's exactly what they are. So, I mean, it was this realization that, holy crap, was I coming from a place of privilege, and holy crap, was I coming from a place of really messed up ideas, but I wasn't realizing it. When I shut up, I was able to listen to what I was saying, and I was able to listen to what they were saying, and I was able to reevaluate my opinion, because I was able to realize that I wasn't saying what I thought I was saying, and what I was saying was really, really bad. <laughs> so, you know, so shut up and listen is basically this whole idea. It's stop talking long enough so to concentrate on what is being said by you and by the other side and more importantly by the other side because a lot of times there's this misunderstanding that what you think they're saying isn't actually what they're saying and we see this a lot in for example discussions of um, harassment policies at uh, conferences in which you know um, there's a lot of proponents of, of uh, harassment policies who say that they're a good idea but the other side of the issue keeps insisting that we're trying to stop people from being able to flirt, from being able to hook up, from being able to meet people, from being able to have human interactions, because, you know, harassment policies must must mean that, you know, we have to sign everything in triplicate and yada, yada, yada. But that's not what it is at all. In fact, most proponents of harassment policies are just as interested in having, in, in you know, hooking up or with meeting somebody or dating or whatnot at these kinds of conferences and events. Because, yes, these conferences and events are situations that are perfectly tailored towards making the kinds of connections that you want with people who think the same way you do or who have enough things in common that it's going to make for a successful relationship. What we're trying to do with harassment policies is create an environment in which it's safe enough for someone to say no that they feel comfortable saying yes. And that may seem like a really, you know, strange concept, but it is one that's actually very important because in a lot of situations, the reason harassment actually stops the ability to uh, is the fact that without harassment policies, is when you're in a circumstance where you don't feel comfortable to say no, it makes it really hard to say yes because you don't because you just want to back away from the whole issue and you want to avoid it completely because you don't feel comfortable in either circumstance because you don't know if if you say yes to this person if there comes a point where you need to say no if the reaction is going to be dangerous if the reaction is going to be uncomfortable unpleasant and so you'd much rather just say no right off the bat and shut off all communication because that way you risk a much violent much less violent reaction doing it now than you do saying no later so i mean it's 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 really that idea and moreover you know it, it facilitates connection because then you can feel comfortable talking to someone knowing that if they take it too far that you have someone you can talk to who's going to help you and that there's enough of a watchful eye over this that you know that you know if you need help you're going to get it and therefore you can relax and you can participate comfortably in this interaction and um this other side of shut up and listen is also that a lot of times people don't really, like they're like I said, they're too busy trying to prove that they're right, that they don't bother to listen to what is actually being said. And a lot of times this ends up really messing with the whole argument. And the best example that I can give of this is um, actually something that happened at Women in Secularism as well, where um, one of the attendees was really only there because they were trying to you know, prove how feminists weren't saying anything worthwhile, how they didn't have any evidence for their claims, and yada, 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 and you probably all know who I'm talking about, but out of, you know, just general not trying to overly rock the boat, I'm not going to name names. But this person, you know, one of the things that they were doing over and over again, one of the things that were really frustrating me on Twitter, was this person constantly was begging for evidence of this, you know, harassment that we were talking about. And whenever somebody tried to show him the examples of harassment by pointing to the YouTube comments that people get and, you know, by pointing to uh, the comments that people get on their blogs, by pointing to the vile emails that they're saying, the vile rumors being spread by them uh, or, or by other people about them, uh, the pictures, the pornographic pictures, the, the you know, the, the dropping of addresses, the 
the uh, the rape threats, all of that, when it was when that was pointed out, when it was documented and presented to them, the person says, "Oh well, you know that doesn't count because it's online, and I don't think online stuff is valid." And to me, that just sounded exactly like a creationist who said, "Prove to me that evolution works, but don't use fossils because I think fossils were planted by the devil, and therefore they're not real evidence." So essentially, what those people are saying is, you know, show me proof, but don't use any proof that disproves what I'm saying, because I'm not going to accept it. And Or another way to say it is just kind of like, hey, I'm going to put my hands over my eyes, and I want you to show me proof, but I'm not seeing any of the proof that you're showing me, therefore you must not have any evidence. And it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. If you're not going to look at the evidence that's presented to you because you're going to come up with all these excuses then you're not really trying to engage in real rational conversation. You're basically just trying to insist that you're right while going la, 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 in terms of what anybody else is saying. And it's the most juvenile thing you could do, and it's the most anti-rational thing that you could do. And it's, it's honestly, like, to me, it just blows my mind that these people think that they're, you know, bastions of reason when, frankly, they are using creationist tactics in their arguments. And it's hilarious to me, but also really frustrating. So, I mean, it, it's this whole thing. And I mean, one of the biggest ways that I can show that their insistence that, you know, online harassment doesn't count as real harassment is, you know, the evidence that we're presented in the fact that online bullying is having a very marketable impact on people. That, you know, t the talk by, um, the, the talk that was done at Women in Secondary, which we were talking about how microaggression actually has an even greater psychological impact. And I mean, a lot of the stuff that's going on couldn't even be, you know, considered microaggression. Um, it's the fact that this entire movement is an online movement because we're a movement of bloggers, of internet bloggers, of, of you know, all these internet movements and internet organizations that, you know, trying to pretend like, oh, well, we're a real movement online, but anything that happens online isn't real is just so disingenuous because it's basically, you might as well just say that we're not a real movement, and in which case, if you think we're not a real movement, then why are you complaining about Mission Drift, because we're not real anyway. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of those arguments are really disingenuous, and I think if they took the opportunity to actually shut up and listen, and spend less time defending themselves, they would probably see that a lot of what they're saying is complete bullshit. Um, and, I mean, the, the other aspect that I mentioned is, you know, listening to what you're saying and, you know, shutting up long enough to listen to what you're saying. And I think this is really important, too. And, I mean, one of the big examples that we saw is with the whole discussion of Michael Shermer and his comments that he made. And, you know, did he mean to say that? Probably not, but that is how it came out. So rather than addressing and saying, oh, shit, you know, I did not mean it this way. I'm really sorry. Um, here's what I meant to say. I apologize for saying it that way. I'll watch myself in the future. Instead, he kept on saying, no, 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 that's not what I said. And then when people showed him exact, uh, you know, an exact transcript of what was said. He was just like, that's out of context. They're like, how is it out of context? That's the entire video that I just posted. It's your entire thing. Is there, are you saying that the video that you posted is out of context? In which case, where's the rest of the context? And it's just this insistence that what he said isn't what he said. But that just doesn't make sense because there's direct evidence that what he said is what he said. You know, so instead he's going to attack directly the person and, you know, accuse it of being a witch, uh, a witch hunter, whatever. And it's just this whole thing where he needs to stop and he needs to listen to what is being said by other people and, more importantly, what is being said by him and how it's in direct contradiction to everything that he teaches when he talks about memes and what people should do and reason. And, I mean, that's a really big thing is if we want to be bastions of reason, we really need to be aware of what it is we're arguing against. And the best way to do that is to listen. But in order to listen properly, we need to not be responding, which means we need to shut up. See how it all works? So shut up and listen isn't never speak again. It's stop talking long enough to be aware of what you're actually responding to. Um, so tune in next time when I, you know, address about why, you know, I, I've addressed privilege, I've addressed hopefully enough to, you know, people understand the concept of shut up and listen, and now I'm going to address, you know, why a lot of the other stuff that happened within the speech and the lecture just was really kind of creeptastic and really needs to be reconsidered by, by Ron Lindsay. Um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope I'll see you next time.